Thanks very much. Yes, I, I want to talk to you about quantum physics. And um, we've had a few people mention quantum physics already as something that we ought to be uh, more aware of, I suppose, and understand a bit better. And uh, maybe I should just ask you, first of all, it, could you raise your hands if you think you understand quantum physics? OK, well, one, one or two, that's great. OK, it was sort of a trap, really, if I asked you that question, because somebody much smarter than I did once said, if you think you understand quantum physics, then you actually haven't understood it properly. Um, but I want to talk to you today about some quantum physics effects. And the reason why I find it so fascinating is because of the fact that it's mind-boggling. Um, we aren't really used in our everyday lives to encounter this, uh, um, th these kind of properties. But at a small scale, small things like atoms and electrons can be in two places at once and do two different things at once. And I don't know what your superpower would be, but this is my friend Ruth. She's a, a singer and musician, and she would really love to be able to, to to have her own band where she plays everything at once. And I just um, would like to sort of offer to you the concept that uh, you could be really, really powerful and you could do really amazing things if you could uh, obey the laws of quantum physics yourself. And we're trying to move towards that situation where we have big, bigger and bigger things obey the principles of quantum physics. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, so quantum physics is all around us, actually, and you will have encountered quantum physics um, several times. You'll have seen it yourself whenever you walk around under sodium street lamps. The thing that determines the color of those sodium street lamps is quantum physics. And here is another example. This might seem like the physics of something really big, but actually the, the red stuff in this picture is uh, hydrogen. It's being stimulated by the hot blue things in the picture, the, the stars. And the color that they emit is uh, a bright red color. Astronomers call it the H-alpha line. It's 656 nanometers, if you're scientifically minded. So, some people often ask me, what's your favorite color? And I reply, 488 nanometers. But I don't know what your response would be. Um, the reason why the hydrogen atoms do this is because of uh, the laws of quantum physics. Can I have the next slide, please? So here we show um, some waves. The reason why the hydrogen atom does that is because it's behaving like a wave. And you're used to wave physics, so you understand um, the way that musical instruments work, I bet. If you pluck a guitar string uh, in the middle of the string, it will do a motion, uh, the fundamental mode of the string. Uh, and you can pluck it maybe a quarter of the way along and three quarters of the way along and let go, and it will play the first harmonic. That's one octave higher. And all that the electron that's orbiting around the hydrogen atom does is just a three-dimensional version of exactly the same thing. So there are specific oscillations that the, that the hydrogen atom can, can perform. And when the atom jumps from one state to another, it emits a, a light of a very specific color uh, corresponding to the uh, energy jump between those two states, and that what's, what gives you the very characteristic lines. And different atoms emit different lines. That's why sodium uh, emits uh, uh, this yellow light that you see in street lights, and why hydrogen emits the red uh, that you saw on the previous uh, on the previous picture. Okay. So a great thing about uh, wa waves, or the thing that makes them different from our sort of everyday experience of uh, of objects and particles, is that they produce interference. So if you add two waves together. They can cancel each other out, or they can amplify each other. So here's a picture where I've shown uh, a pair of uh, light sources, and they are producing uh, an interference pattern. Uh, and you can uh, sort of understand that in terms of waves. But if I said, now what if particles and objects could do the same sort of thing? Supposing I took a pair of footballers, and I put them uh, at one end of the football pitch, and I told them to shoot towards a goal. It would be really surprising if I could set up the goal in some place at the far end of the field where it would be impossible for the footballers to get the balls in. But actually, atoms do exactly this. We can make a, a pair of sources of atoms, and we can fire the atoms out into space, and we can put a detector in the back of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the space where we're firing the atoms, and we can set it up so that um, the atoms have no probability of going into the detector. Move the detector a little bit to one side, and then the atoms go through. So atoms and small-scale things obey this wave-like property. Um, we're just not used to seeing that on a large scale. Can I have the next click? Uh, no, you can also interfere waves in time as well. If you add two waves together, you can get new kinds of motion. So if um, you add the fundamental mode of your guitar string and the, uh, and the one octave higher, you can get a slightly jelly-like wobbling motion. 
And the same thing with the atoms. You can put them into a, a, a situation where they are doing two things at once. They are both in the low frequency mode and they are in the high frequency mode at the same time. So when a quantum physicist tells you that something can do two things at once and it can be in two places at once, I mean, what, what if I ask you that this um, first harmonic wave where is the wave? You would say, well, it's sort of in two places. It's at the top of the string and it's at the bottom of the string. It's in both places at once. So when, as I say, a quantum physicist tells you things can be in two places at once or it can do two things at once, what they really mean is it's obeying wave physics. So here's a little um, guitar demonstration. You can see that if you click the button, the move should start. Yes, so you pluck the guitar string in the middle and you see it just does the fundamental mode of uh, vibration if I play it in slow motion. We can um, see that uh, putting your uh, finger on the 12 fret, that's the one with the two spots, that's exactly halfway along, plays this uh, fundamental mode. But I can play the second harmonic, uh, the, 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 the first, uh, the first uh, excited, say, one octave higher by plucking the string a quarter of the way along. Now I can do something a bit more complicated. I can play a, a harmonic chord, both notes at once, if I pluck the string a quarter of the way along, but I lightly touch in the middle. Now you can see that the, the, the wave motion is flowing back and forth along the, the string. It's actually playing both notes at once. If I had recorded the sound of the guitar at the, at the same time as making this movie, you would actually be able to hear the difference. In the first case, you would hear a low note. The second case, you would hear a high note. And then with uh, the harmonic chord, you would hear both notes at the same time. Now, Okay, these wave-like properties, uh, what can they do for us? So, um, one of the fathers of quantum physics, Erwin Schrödinger, um, thought of an experiment that you might be able to get us this uh, small-scale properties to the larger scale. And he imagined um, a situation. What would happen if I took an atom, and the atom, I put it into this situation where it's doing both things at once. It's both in the, the relaxed state and it's in the excited state at the same time. And supposing I take a detector, which is capable of sensing which of the two states the atom is in, then presumably the detector will be triggered and untriggered at the same time. And supposing I collect, connect it via some mechanism to a bottle of poison, and the, bo the bottle of poison can be then both broken and unbroken at the same time. And what if I put a cat next to the bottle of poison? The cat can then be both poisoned and not poisoned. And strange things about quantum physics are that if you don't look at the situation, if you don't make a measurement, then the objects can be in this two states at once. So the cat ought to be both alive and dead. If I uh, put all this stuff into a box, close the box, if I put the atom into the excited state, gradually the atom will relax as a function of time. It's the probability of being in the excited state will, will decay, but the atom is actually in both states at once, and therefore the cat should be both alive and dead at once. Uh, actually, Schrodinger postulated this uh, thought experiment in order to try to show how absurd quantum physics was. He, he actually didn't believe it. He thought there was a fundamental problem with quantum physics. Actually, we now believe that it, it's true. You can put large-scale things in two states at once. Now, why has nobody ever done this experiment? Well, okay, apart from it being in, inhumane, it's actually a really, really, really hard experiment because of the number of atoms that are inside a cat. I talked about the ability of very small objects to obey wave-like properties. Um, there are 10 to the power of 26 atoms inside a cat. That's a one with 26 zeros uh, on it. That's a lot of things to put into to this uh, uh, very carefully controlled state. And the other reason why nobody's done it is because it's actually a really boring experiment. The, the idea that you would set up the atom in the excited state, put everything into the box, close the box, wait for the thing to be in two states at once, and then eventually open the box and see what state the cat, the cat is in. It, once you open it and look inside, the cat will then decide either to be alive or dead. And sometimes you'll measure alive, and sometimes if you repeat the experiment, you'll measure dead. And the, the sum of those two probabilities will be 100%. So what? Who cares? But maybe we can add control. Supposing we can control whether or not the cat is alive or how much alive it is. Now we start to get to something really interesting. And in fact, um, this kind of idea has actually been around for a long time. I don't know if anybody here has ever had an MRI scan. Uh, if you've had an MRI scan, you will have been put into a, a, a machine that actually puts all of the hydrogen atoms in your body into the state where they're both spinning clockwise and anti-clockwise at the same time. 
And when they do that, when they're in this um, superposition state, they emit radio waves you can detect, and therefore you can see how much hydrogen there is and where it is. And that's what gives you the contrast on the MRI image. It's telling you where the water is in your body. And where there's water, you see radio waves, and when there isn't any water, you don't see them. And where the radio waves have come from is just the hydrogen atoms that are in this superposition state. So it gives us um, some really interesting technologies. But there isn't any information technology that uses this idea yet. Uh, information technology we're pretty familiar with. It makes our silicon computer chips. Um, and here's so, some pictures of uh, actually not quite the current smallest, but this is a, the small, uh, from a couple of years ago, one of the smallest transistors that had ever been made, 50 nanometers. Now we're down to about 17 nanometers being the smallest uh, transistors. That's about... that's. Um, uh, 20 billionths of a meter. It's extremely small. And the information inside those transistors is carried by whether or not the transistor is on or off. It gives us the ones and zeros of binary information. And we're getting to the point now where, where we can um, uh, think of uh, making transistors where the information, instead of being zero or one, the transistor being on or off, we have transistors where the transistor is both on and off at the same time. Next uh, slide, please. Um, and even better than that, we can actually couple transistors together to get pairs of transistors. Imagine if I have a pair of atoms. Um, there are, there's now um, four pieces of information can be stored in just two atoms because I need to keep track of the probability that both atoms are excited, that uh, the left one is excited and the right one is relaxed. Uh, left relaxed and right excited or both relaxed. That's four different probabilities I need to keep track of. There's four pieces of information are in that system. Whereas if I have two ordinary transistors, there's only two pieces of information. It's, uh, the left one is on or off, and the right one is on or off. And you can imagine if I have three transistors, then there'd be eight pieces of information, and so on. It goes up exponentially. So quantum transistors and quantum computer registers would be really powerful for quantum information technology. And we're getting to the point where we can engineer single atoms inside silicon chips. Here's my friend Philip, he's a, a research student um, at University College London, and we've overcome the challenge of being able to position an individual atom on the surface of a silicon chip now. Uh, here you see a, a micrograph that shows a silicon crystal. The surface of the silicon crystal is, is illustrated. You see each individual silicon atom in the crystal. And he's, uh, Philip has positioned uh, on the surface a single atom, a single impurity atom, and it's bulging out at the center. It's also causing the neighboring silicon atoms to bulge out a little bit as well. But there's just one single impurity there that he's positioned with atomic precision. And that's a, a really amazing engineering challenge. It's a bit like, um, well, it's actually exactly the same scale factors as trying to manipulate individual ping pong balls on the surface of the sun from Earth. So it's a, a, a really uh, amazing feat of engineering. Uh, and how do you pluck these atoms? How do you cause them to go into these two states at once and the, 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 this uh, strange light -like oscillation of being both excited and relaxed? Well, you need um, some clever lasers. Uh, you use laser pulses to do the plucking of the string. Uh, and here are some results. I hope I don't get scooped. We were talking, uh, we had the previous speaker on the TED conference was talking about being scooped. These are unpublished results, so please don't tell anybody. Don't, uh. um, but we've demonstrated now with these individual atoms that we can get these interferences. So the, the, the data here shows clear oscillations. And I've, uh, I've shown here the, the, the spectrum of the oscillations, showing that we get this very clear note uh, lasting for long times after the original plucking of the string. Uh, and this is evidence that we have um, quantum interference in these individual atoms. So we're getting very close now to the point where we can make uh, a big computer register. Uh, and I'd just like to end with a, a little bit of a movie to illustrate how you might use or imagine the power of a, of a quantum computer. so many things to do. Imagine how efficient you'd be if you could split into multiple versions of yourself, the ultimate in multitasking. And what if you could then get your friends to do the work for you by getting them to split so that they could be in two places at once? This magical behavior is exactly what goes on in the quantum world. 
Atoms can indeed be made to split into several versions of themselves. We say they're in a superposition of different states. They can also spread themselves over multiple locations and entangle with other atoms. This is the basis of a quantum computer in which all possible computations can be carried out at once. Okay, so that was maybe a bit futuristic. It's going to be a long, long time before we can clone individual people because, as I say, the, uh, the difference between a big human person and a small atom is quite large. Uh, but actually, we only need to get of the order of 100 atoms into this two states at once in order to be able to make uh, the most powerful computer that you could possibly imagine. You, in, inside your ordinary mobile phone, there are billions of transistors, but I only need 100 quantum transistors in order to be able to beat that, that phone. And so we're, we're getting to the place where we can really imagine uh, a, a revolutionary change in our quantum technologies. But, I, okay, I, so I started this talk by talking about the mental challenge, and actually that's what really motivates me in doing this research, is I find it just so strange, that the quantum ideas of being in two places at once and doing two different things at once, and trying to understand uh, what's going on when I do my experiments uh, is uh, sort of a surreal, um, it's a s surreal uh, idea, and uh, so the academic research in this area I find a fascinating thing, and I, um, so that's why I love to, to to work in this area. And I should also say that um, uh, something that the previous speaker mentioned, we should be trying to teach uh, smaller children these kind of ideas. I think um, I've been well, I've been, actually had an experience of this going on. Um, going to science fairs like the Big Bang Science Fair and the Royal Society Summer Science Fair and meeting children and telling them the, these ideas about being in two places at once, they don't bat an eyelid. So the more we expose them to this kind of thing uh, at an early age, uh, the better we'll all understand quantum physics. So I'd just like to thank my sponsor. Um, e can you get to the next slide? Yes, so my, my sponsor, EPSRC, and my friends who generated these, uh, these results, and thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>